Welcome to this evening's webinar with myself, Tess Howe and Matt Price from um, G's. We are looking at turning you all into motivational superheroes this evening. Um, so if you'd like to sit with us for the next hour or so, we're going to go through a few top tips on how to motivate yourself and most importantly, the people around you as well. So first of all, just a few bits of housekeeping. As um, attendees, you're all on mute. If you'd like to ask any questions, then please type in um, questions on your screen and they will come through to us and I can start to see um, the questions on my screen and we'll ask those as we go through this evening. Um, we won't be asking any, but any names or anything like that, so just ask whatever you'd like to do. It's all anonymous from that perspective and we aim to have you finished by around eight o'clock this evening. So introductions first. Uh, my name's Tess Howe. I'm the Senior Skills Manager at AHDB and I'm largely responsible for uh, the professional development of our farmers and growers, but also the, the people management and leadership element of, um, of staff in the farming business. And tonight we're looking at motivation. We know it's been a, a long, hard summer for a lot of people out there and, and we know that the mood can get quite low and, and people can get quite down about what they're doing and where they're going. So we've got a brilliant um, presentation from Matt tonight, who's gonna share some of his tips um, with us today. Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, evening everybody. My name's Matt Price. Um, as it says on the screen, I'm the uh, Head of Learning and Development for G's. I've been with G's just short of two years. Uh, I look after early careers um, and learning and development across the whole group. So that's the uh, UK, Spain, Czech Republic, Poland and US. Um, and it's first time I've worked in agriculture. Um, so it's been a really interesting uh, place to understand if my theories and the way that I've worked in the past actually works in this industry. Uh, and I'll hopefully share some of those with you tonight and some of the good things and some of the things that haven't worked quite so well. But yes, yeah, all good fun, looking forward to it. That's brilliant. And, and Matt, you've, you've already delivered this to a group of my managers and I know it resonated a lot with them and there was, there was quite a bit of humour throughout the, the evening as well. So hopefully that'll come through tonight as well. And if we get yeah, started... <laughs> So let's get started. Are you a Hoover or a Groover? What What do you mean by this, Matt? What do I mean by Hoover and Groover? Um, I came across this quite a few years ago, um, and it's what you've got on the screen. You've got a mood Hoover, so it's a moody Hoover, um, or you've got Austin Powers, who's the ultimate mood Groover. Uh, well, certainly when I was growing up and watching uh, Austin Powers on TV, he was the Groover. Um, these are the types of people you actually get at work. Uh, is what I believe, or not just at work, but in life generally, you get some people that are mood hoovers and they literally suck the life and the energy out of a situation or the environment and everything's negative and it's just really hard to be around. Or you've got the Austin Powers, the mood groomer, groovy baby. Um, and they're out there and they just put life and energy into absolutely everything they do. Um, now, you've got the two extremes. You've got the mood groomer, who just kills the life out of the situation. And you've got the mood groomer. Now, if you've got a mood groomer in your team and you go in there as the mood groomer, it could be too much. It's almost two extremes and they clash against each other. So you've got to have a bit of a balance between the two. But the biggest thing is understanding who you are, what you are and how you become across. Because sometimes, you know, I, I certainly know that I, uh, I like to be a bit of a mood groover when I'm teaching and when I'm working and out and about and doing bits and pieces. Um, but I also know when I come home sometimes with a family, I'm a bit of a mood groover because I've been out there giving it all up there. So you can't be all things all the time. But actually, those mood groovers, what is it they've got? What is it? What, how can they keep up that energy all the time? Because we do get them and we get people that are constantly in that positive space and they're motivated and they're just always in a great place, putting energy into the, into the environment and just creating energy around them and sharing that with people. And for me, trying to understand that and how to be the mood groover and what drives them was really interesting. 
And that, that's really what sent me on the journey of trying to understand more about motivation, how we motivate staff. And over the last, I think, 25 years now, I've been sort of looking into motivation and the key elements around motivation. And uh, yeah, understanding yourself, where you are, and can you change? Are you always a hoover or are you always a groover? Can we move? What drives each one? Um, and that's the interesting part. So really keen to sort of uh, unpick this throughout this evening and find out you know, what makes those groovers groovy and what makes those hoovers quite hoovery. And I think that's, it's, it's, everybody can see both of those personalities and everything in between, can't they? But I think taking it slightly off piste a little bit, Matt, because I think you, you flag a really important point there, especially when it, it's mental health week this week. And you're a groover at work, but a hoover at home. Mm. Have, you, have you got any tips for people? Because I think that's a really common, everybody gives it their all during those nine, ten hours at work and actually then comes home in, in a completely different position. And I, I, that can be quite hard on you, can't it? It can be hard. It also, you know, there, there, there's psychometric tests out there and one of them is called uh, Myers-Briggs type indicator. And one of the things in Myers-Briggs, it says you're either an introvert or an extrovert. And that's not necessarily on your behaviours, but that's from where you get your energy from. Now, I certainly know that where I get my energy from is by being very quiet, very relaxed, chill down. I, it's almost like I come home, I plug into the mains, I charge up overnight, and then the next day I come out and I can be in the mood groover again. And throughout the day, my batteries are wearing down, and then I need to just plug in in the evening and recharge. So I get two different behaviours. So the people that see me at work, they see the groover in me, but the people that see me at home see the hoover side of me, probably. Now, other people might be the extrovert, where actually, if you plug them into a box and just let them recharge, they don't want that. They charge naturally by being out there and seeing people and meeting people and doing lots of different events all the time. And every so often, they might need to just recharge at the end of the day, but generally, they like to have things going on and meeting things all the time. And that's what gives them energy. So it really is around your traits, your preferences of what you like to do and how you, how you like to behave and what you've been used to. But with everything, you can change them. People sort of think, well, we can't change it. It's how I am. And actually, there's research suggesting that the way we are is all learnt. We've learnt these behaviours over years, predominantly through the first sort of seven or eight years in our life. Um, but actually, you can change those behaviours if they become uh, a place where they become a problem for you. So when we talk about mental health, um, some of these behaviours, if you speak to the right people, get the right uh, coaching, right environment, you can learn to change those behaviours if you need to. Brilliant, thank you. So we've learned that you're the groover at work, and um, so do you always put your pants on the outside and put a cloak on there as well? No, I've, I've been known to at times, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, I think this is uh, this is where the uh, uh, motivation superhero came from on the, uh, from this presentation tonight. As I, I shared this picture on the previous one. Uh, and I said, when, when you called it the motivation superhero, I was thinking, where have you got that from? And I looked back at the slides and there we go, it's the motivation superhero. Um, yeah, this is the four minute superhero. Very similar to the energy sketch at the front end where you move over the mood groove line. But certainly, if, if you go back to the good old days, and I'm, I'm, when I say the good old days, that's pre COVID. Um, and pre COVID was my job would take me away for days, weeks at a time where I'm delivering training, coaching around the UK, in Europe, wherever. And I could be away from the family for quite a long time. Um, when I get home from uh, traveling away or teaching for the last few days, really tired and I want to get in and I just want to drop my bags, sit on the sofa and just relax, plug in and just be a, a mood hoover. Um, that's what I want to do. That's what I need to do. But actually, my children, when I come home, I've got two young boys, they're now 13 and 11. Um, do they want dad to come in and be the mood hoover? No, they don't. So what do I need to do? I need to come in and for the first four minutes, I need to be a mood groover. I need to come in, shut my bags down, dive on the sofa, have a laugh. He doing boys, what's going on? But within two to three minutes, guarantee they're getting bored. They walk off. But what do they remember? They've remembered dad is the superhero. He's come in and he's loads of energy because that's what they remember. But And it's two to three minutes. You apply that to work on the other side. When we set the day up for work, when we turn up for work, what state do we turn up in? How do we set the day up? 
when we set a meeting up, when we've got a board meeting or a um, or a team meeting, how do we set that up for the day? Do we go in there and go, oh, it's been a really hard day. Uh, nothing's going well for me whatsoever. If I go in with that energy, that's how the energy of the meeting or the day is going to go. And that's what people are going to remember. I need to go in there at the right level of energy to get the right results for the motivation in the background. So as I come into this situation, right guys, what we're going to do today is we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and we're going to have a really fun day and make it work. So I'm going to set the energy where I think it needs to be. If we've got loads to do and we've got to be really high energy, I'm going to come in and be really high energy. Guys, come on, we've got to put lots of energy into this. Let's go, let's make it work. Or I can just bring it down gently with my voice and just say, right guys, what's going on today? Normal day, brilliant, everyone happy, well done, and move on. So using my voice and my energy that I give out, really sets the tone and you've got to remember when you set that tone that energy that's what they remember and you only need to do it for the first four minutes because that's what they remember the rest of the meeting you can chill out and relax a little bit but those first four minutes set the energy where you want it to be because that will be where everybody remembers and takes that motivation into the workplace so that's where the four minute superhero comes from and if you <clears throat> do you run the risk of sounding a bit fake matt if you're really that down you've just had some a bad decision come through and then you've got to go in into a room with the, with all the rest of your staff Are you, can you run the risk of it looking fake or is it just literally that four minutes of energy is enough for me personally I, this is just everybody we do it naturally this is what we're going to remember you actually do this naturally we're just labeling things that the human brain can can do and we do it sometimes at a subconscious level and um, when we want to motivate people and get people to do something we generally put a bit more energy into it sometimes we've lost that thought so when we say we look fake doing it we do it anyway we're only asking we're only consciously starting to put things into practice that we already do so by just going actually i'm going to put a bit of energy into here because i want to get people to work your intention is positive you want to get positive results out of it so all intentions are positive so going in there and just putting a bit of energy in and trying to help people what's wrong with that even if people go, you're not normally like that well it doesn't matter you're there, you try, you've got the positive intentions trying to make the great things happen. And we, we've had a question come in. So you've set that energy for that four minutes. How do you either maintain it or bring it down to a so, suitable level if, if that's not a natural state for you and you're, you're just trying to G the team up? Yeah. So literally after four minutes, and this is this has been uh, this has been studied, after four minutes, you can just relax and go into your normal tone of work because what people will remember when they leave that room is the first four minutes of energy and I, i'll have to uh, try and find the paper or the research that that's done on but there's actually a study done that all people remember is that first four minutes of that energy of that meeting or that day and uh, that's where they'll remember that back from the meeting and take that forward that's fantastic so start it with high energy or the energy you want it to be at and then just drop into your normal voice and carry on the meeting people remember that first energy piece Brilliant. So there's some good ideas for what we need to do as, as individuals to sort of motivate those around us. But how do we actually G other people up? We G ourselves up now. How do we help other people? Yeah. Um, how do we help other people? Um, this is this is some work from uh, a guy that I started researching and reading about with a gentleman called Dan Pink. He's an economist in America. Um, there's a link at the end of this presentation to his video there's a great video on youtube that i'd recommend people to watch um and he talks about there's three areas in motivation that we need to understand and they're the three that you've got on the screen purpose mastery autonomy or the slightly different order on the screen we need to understand what gets us out of bed in the morning why do we come to work why do we get up every day and do what we do why does your why do your staff do the same so you understand it for yourself you understand it for yourself why do we get up now I, i've asked that in many a room uh, uh many a training room to say why do you why do you come to work why do you do it standard answer money okay we get money what's more than money though because you could go anywhere and get money because remember there's a choice we choose to come to work why do you choose to come to this job and get this money here what else are you getting from it what's more than money that you're getting from this job because we get everything from a behavior, we, we need something back from it. And that's your purpose. Why do I work in training and development? Because I know that I get loads from helping people and developing people and supporting people. That's something that's really true to my values that, that I get there. So as long as I've got a strong purpose and I'm getting something back, 
which is more than money, then that purpose is really powerful. It almost, almost creates a power pack for you, your purpose. Doing some training, doing some coaching to find out more around your purpose is quite a powerful, powerful thing to actually uh, go and do. And I really recommend people looking into, why have I chosen this job? And sometimes you've got to look back to say, well, what did I want to be when I was a child? And I did this exercise recently with a, with a boardroom. You know, what did you want to be when you knew you couldn't fail? When you were growing up, what did you want to be? And when we looked at the roles that people wanted to be, they were in completely different roles now, but actually the values of what that role gives, people were still getting from the role today, which was quite interesting. And they started to link those up to go, wow, okay, that's what I'm getting from this. Purpose gives you drive. You really need to know why you're getting up. Why do, what am I getting from coming to work every day that's more than money? When I understand my purpose, I want to be brilliant at it. And that's the mastery element. So what we want to do is we want to understand purpose and then do, develop the skills, the training around the mastery. So let's put it into a slightly different context. So there's people in their own time who really like music and they want to learn a musical instrument. So they might choose the piano or the guitar. Um, and when they've, when they've chosen that and they want, to, they want to learn that, they've got a purpose around themselves. They really want to learn this there. So they spend hours and hours and hours of their own time that they're not getting paid for to learn how to play the guitar or the piano. They want to become masters at it. They want to become brilliant at it. And that's a motivational drive. When I got into learning and development, I wanted to be the best learning and development person out there, the best people development person out there. So I've got a passion to really help people and support people, and I want to be brilliant at it. So I've done lots of training courses in that area. I've now got all my training courses. I've got a high purpose. Do you know what? I just want to get on with it now, the autonomy to get on and do my job, because that's what it's about. I've got purpose, mastery, autonomy. You need all three to get motivation in the workplace. So let's play this out for a second. I've got a high sense of purpose to help people. I've got all the skills to do it, but my boss tells me I can't do it. I've got to do it in a slightly different way or that. How motivated am I going to be? Uh -uh, not going to happen. I've got loads of skills and I've got all the autonomy in the world, but I'm not really interested in doing it in that. I'll be trained in the wrong thing. Suddenly, I've got, or I've got high purpose and I've got loads of autonomy, but I've got no skill set. I haven't been trained to do it. My motivation dies. You need all three at a high level to get motivation. So when I speak to my staff, I ask them, you know, what is it? Why have you chosen to do this job? What's this career path doing for you that's more than just money? What are you getting back from it? Really start understanding what their purpose is. Then I help them develop that purpose. And I give them the skill set, I train them, give them lots of training to do that. And then I ask them, what support do you need from me now? Do you need me to back off, give you all the autonomy, or do you still need me quite close to you? Whereabouts do you want me within this relationship so you get that full purpose mastery autonomy? So if you get all three right, you get this intrinsic motivation, this internal drive where you just keep going. You forget to have lunch during the day. You work over because you go, God, I don't realize the day's gone so far. You forget to eat, you get to sleep, you just keep doing it because you love what you're doing. And that, if we can create that in the workspace, it's amazing. It's a great place to be. The culture changes overnight and it just becomes a really exciting place to work. And when you're working with people like that, they generally put into the mood groover space and they're all grooving around the business, grooving, breeds, grooving, and all of a sudden you've got a phenomenal place to be and work. So understanding people's purpose, help them with their skill set, the mastery, give them the space to allow them to use that, you'll get motivated staff. And it's, it's a powerful tool to, to understand those three. And how would you recommend somebody looks at putting that in place for their for their staff how how does somebody look at how they can develop the mastery and the and the autonomy from your perspective yeah for, for me i i generally do this at the front end when i when i recruit somebody else sit down and uh, ask them around those questions and I'll, I'll be sitting down and asking you know why have you chosen to come and work in this field um and then i'll also do it at their appraisals you know either the monthly check-ins or at six monthly appraisals or yearly appraisals but every time i check in with a member of staff I'll be asking them, I'll be reconfirming their purpose, you know, asking them what their purpose is so they remember why they did this, what the purpose is. 
And then the, the mastery is, is their personal development plan, their career development plan, whatever it is, is that you use in your business is to say, what do you need to become great at this job? What, what skill sets are you missing that you really want to develop? Because, you know, there, there's two ways of looking at it. You know, we, we certainly know that most appraisals, when we do appraisals at the end of a year or whatever, we'll do a development plan and go, they'll say to me, Matt, you're really good at doing A, B, and C. You're really good at those three things. Um, but we want to train you and develop you as an all ready person. So we want to train you in X, Y, and Z. It's proven that that will re reduce my motivation by up to 36%. And you're thinking, well, why is that the case? Because they're giving me all rounded courses. Well, actually, what they want to be doing is this. This is the new way of thinking. Matt, you're really good at doing A, B, and C. We want you to go away and become even better at A, B, and C. I'm like, yeah, bring it on. Because I want to be, I love that stuff. I want to go and become even better at those things. So we need to start listening to our staff, understanding what their purpose is, understanding what their skill set and what their drive is going to be, and give them the autonomy in that space. Now, there's always going to be areas where we need to, help them with other things, you know, that they're not so good at, we, we get that, but put the predominant focus on what they love doing, because you'll get motivated workforce, and the production uh, will, will go through the roof in those individuals, and their performance will go through the roof. So the majority of it needs to be around what they're great at doing, and what they enjoy doing, their passion, their purpose, their drive, develop that skill set, the rest of the stuff will develop naturally around it. That's brilliant. We, we've got a couple of questions come in. So one is um, <clears throat> from the superhero slide, actually. And just yeah. going back to um, if there's if there's people out there that are working for you and, and they're struggling, <clears throat> not got a lot of motivation at the moment, possibly a little bit of mild depression. Can that four minute enthusiasm still engage them when they're feeling in, when they're as down as that? Or is it is it time to switch tack when you've got people like that in the team that need help? If we we need to always meet them initially on their same level of energy, if it's on a one to one basis or if a whole group is down, you need to meet them on their level of energy. Where are, where are they at? If I if they're in a mood Hoover sort of space and I come in at a really high energy, it can clash and put them into into a bad space and they won't even acknowledge me in that space. So I always need to come down and meet them. How are you doing? What's going on today? How are you feeling? And as I'm talking to them, I'm then going to slowly start picking my energy up and say, you know, we can start moving into this space and we can get there and then we can start looking at the future. And when we start looking at the future, we can start putting these great things in place that will really help both of us. And we can start being good in the future and I'll finish it on a real high energy. So sometimes you've got to be a little bit careful. Um, however, your intention to put energy into a situation and be really positive around people is infectious somebody's got to start that there's a great video out there about the, the crazy dancer i think it is about a leadership pandemic to start a pandemic somebody's got to start being positive somebody's got to start doing something new and everybody looks at them and go that's a bit weird that's a bit crazy but actually you get the early adopters then come in the early adopters then start copying and modeling that behavior and then suddenly the people around then go oh will join in and suddenly you create a movement a pandemic and you've created a positive culture going on and the idea is somebody's got to start that now you know the last nine months this year i imagine there's a lot of heaviness out there's a lot of hoovers out there um, a lot of businesses are struggling and have probably gone down that route it takes some special people to really come up and start becoming that engage the energy and you know they talk about restarting you know restart britain restart the local areas but it's also about restarting business restarting the energy and we need people out there now to really get out there and start putting energy in there it's hard work it's not easy because putting energy out all the time is it, tiring you know that's maybe why at the end of the day i like to go home and just whew, to take a breather but actually you've got to get out there and start putting that energy out, out to these people and into these businesses to start creating that change we need to get through this and get through to next year and into the fantastic places and the spaces we want to be working in. And um, I'm sure this is one that, that you come across in your company because I know you've got quite a few factory sites. If you've got somebody doing the same job regularly, living wage, a factory, um, and for them probably the, the financial driver is is money for them. How yeah. can you improve them to improve? How can you motivate them to improve um, production when they're just doing the same thing all the time? Yeah, it's it's 
purpose mantra for me is really powerful when uh, you've got to start doing some creative thinking and you're in more than just doing uh, putting something into a box or doing a repetitive task. When we're doing a repetitive task activity, like working on a production line, um, money is a motivator. Um, and we need to almost pay people so money is off the table. Um, and that's not always possible. So it, it is tough to do that. Creating the right environment by putting the energy in there is a start by speaking to them. But then actually dropping, having conversations with those staff and understanding why they're coming to do that job and finding their purpose out, it might be that they want to earn more money. And, and that might generally be the reason they're there to do that. It's to earn more money, to support their family and to live a better life. A lot of people want to do that. So let's actually use that then. Let's not go any deeper than that actually we want to earn more money. So how can I help you earn more money? What skill set do you need to learn to earn more money? And let's help them with their development. Let's help them with their skills in the workplace. Not all training costs money because a lot of people say, well, training costs a lot of money. It does. Training is, I can't get over some of the costs of the training providers that are out there myself. But not all training costs. It could be shadowing. It could be listening to podcasts. It could be all lots of different research. There's so much free training online now that people can go to. Help them with their skill set. Suddenly, if somebody's offering them that little bit of help and a bit of advice around their mastery, around purpose, you'll start seeing a shift. We start creating that shift. We then build on that and build on it. And suddenly we've created that movement that we want to make. Yeah, we, I, I was with a company um, not so long ago, actually, and they got their own staff to make their how to videos and actually mm. and, and almost gave bonuses for the people that made the funny one or the most dramatic theatrical one, yeah. et cetera. And just put a bit of fun into that learning and sharing. But they were it was repetitive tasks they were doing, but actually it gave them a, a bit of sense of worth for showing everybody else how to do it. Yeah, fantastic. So how do you feel about adding empathy into that mix as well, Matt? I think it's, you know, a lot of people say it's a soft skill, um, leadership management of soft skills, you know, coaching soft skills. Well, for me personally, they're the hard skills of the future. We've got to be great at doing all those skills. We have to have empathy in the workplace. We need to be able to coach in the workplace. We need to be able to ask great questions in the workplace. We know that employees now, um, especially the newer generations coming into the workforce, they're more likely to stay with a business if they like their manager or they get on with their manager. Normally, the older generations, if they like the values of the business, they'll stay. New, newer generations, younger generations are now, if I like my manager, I'll stay. If I don't, I'm gone. We have to be great people managers. We have to be able to motivate and engage our staff. If we're doing that, we know we're going to keep staff. And that's then going to create, you know, save money. We're going to get the training involved. We're going to develop them. We're going to keep them longer. It's just a great place to be. And if you've got a valued team member who you're really clear on the purpose and, and they've got the autonomy, how do you go about building that mastery with them? Uh, ask them. Ask them what they need. Uh, I've, I've generally found I can sit there and look through my map of the world. And when I talk about my map of the world, that's how I see the world through my lenses, my glasses, my values, my beliefs. So when I look at somebody and what they're doing, I think they might need X, Y and Z. Um, and that's what I think they need. Actually, if I just sit there and ask them, say, what training do you think you need? What development do you need to, to work on? They'll tell me. They'll absolutely tell me what they need and what they want. And nine times out of 10, it might be what I'm thinking, but there's quite a few times actually, it's not what I was thinking, but they were absolutely right. If they tell me what training courses or development they need, and I can arrange that for them, the chances are they'll actually learn on that course and then start applying that back in the workplace. If I tell somebody that they've got to go and do a training course that they don't really want to do, they're probably not going to learn it and they won't apply it back into the workplace. So just sitting there and asking them um, in, in their one-to-ones is, is vital. A lot of people get held up with um, uh, what, what system do I need to have for a one-to-one? -one? Um, where do I record it and all these bits and pieces? Yes, that's important, recording it, but it's not as important as having the conversation. Sitting down with your staff, either be it one-to-one -one or one-to-many, and just asking them questions, getting them to think, setting the energy and, and creating this motivation is the most powerful thing we can do. And, and invest our time into into people. Management 
you know, I, I listened to a, a guy speak a while ago. He asked the question. He said, how many player managers do we have in the premiership in, in football? And, uh, and there's none. And he goes, you know why that is? Because managing is a full-time responsibility. If we're playing two, we're not doing our job. And we want to be a premiership side. We want to be brilliant. So actually, being a manager, you should be investing time speaking to your staff. You should be investing time doing what managers should be doing or what leaders should be doing and not necessarily doing the operational day job activities. And sometimes that's hard. You know, there's a lot of times, especially some of those early middle managers, they're getting pulled from the top and pulled from the bottom. It's a really tough place to be. I get that. And that's why with those guys, you've really got to check in with purpose and mastery and keep them on form. They're a really important group of people to work with. But also we've got to make time for everybody else and understand their purpose and their mastery. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. That when we see people go through the management programs, one of the biggest things they come out with is we've stopped working in the business and we work on the business. And that's when you see that change, isn't it? It's when they've got that difference. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a different mindset. And it's, uh, you know, people need to realise that actually managing is a full time responsibility. Yeah. So a couple more questions and we'll move on to the next slide. If um, I'm starting work four hours before everybody else, getting tired, ready for breakfast, how do you put that energy in when they all arrive fresh at work and you've been there? No, ready for the first break. It's tough. It's the job of a manager. You've got to just keep trying. You've got to keep putting it on, um, and you've got to train yourself. Because end of the day, what what's happening there is we, we put a behaviour on, and when we go to work, we put the coat on, and we learn a set of behaviours. And by behaving in a certain way, we get something back from it. So let's take that right back to childhood, for instance. A, a, a baby will cry. Why does a baby cry? Because it needs attention. So whenever we behave in a certain way, we get something back from this behavior and it becomes a learned behavior. And we create these patterns of behaviors in, 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 in the way we operate, the way we work. And it's to get to, to let people know something that's going on. We let people know when I can sweat that I'm tired already. We let people know that I'm really busy at work by acting really busy. There's lots of these things that we do. And we've, we've learned them over years and years and years of how we operate. We need to start understanding that actually we need to start displaying some behaviours that aren't just about me, but about others, especially when we're in those management positions. And we've got to just try them on. We've got to sometimes start with pretending. The more we pretend it, suddenly we'll start believing it. So actually, by going into the workplace, you may feel tired. You may feel absolutely knackered from whatever you've been doing. But you've just got to put that energy in there and just put it on. Four minutes. That's all we're asking. Four minutes. Just put that energy on for four minutes. Give it everything and then let them go. And then you can sit back and go, oh. Right now, what we've got to do for the rest of the day. But it's so important to get that right at the front end of a meeting or front end of the day to set the energy for where we want to be and what we, where we're working for. So we've got quite a specific question now, but I, I know it's not uncommon. I've seen it before as well. We've an employee that drinks high energy drinks four to five a day, constantly having highs and lows. Tried talking to him about it, but not interested. How do I make him realise that it's affecting his work? Because he denies it um have some evidence um and you know confront them um you've got to sit down and have that conversation ar around what's going on give it clear evidence of what is happening and uh, when you've experienced it this is what i experienced here this is what i've experienced there and you've got to remember feedback is correct from the person giving the feedback um, the individual will not see that through their map of the world uh, when they're looking through their lenses. That, so you've got to start explaining it from your area. Um, I use a feedback model, which um, I used to use the standard one, which was the, uh, the, the not very nice sandwich, where you start with a nice bit of bun on the top, then you went into the development part in the middle, then you finish with a ni nice bit on the end. Or they called it the bathtub effect, where you, if you follow the straight line, you go straight along the top with the good stuff, you drop down, go along the bottom, creating a drawing of a bathtub where the developmental is, and then you finish on the top. I wasn't ever very comfortable using feedback, those two feedback models. Um, and I tried coming up with a different set uh, of feedback and I did a little bit of research and there's a guy in there called Diltz uh, and he uses a model and he asks, he asks questions and he just says, what have you done well today? What have you done well today? What else? What else have you done? Yeah, really good. And he pulls out all the great things they've done in that position. And then they ask, what would you do differently next time to make it better? 
And then you ask, what else, what else, what else? And hopefully they'll come up with what you're thinking anyway. If they don't, that's where your opportunity is to say, well, what I'd like to think you could do differently next time as well is try to uh, keep your behaviours more consistent along that area. Um, and that would then allow other people to be more responsive around you or whatever the result would be from that. Um, so we ask the questions, what you do well, what would you do differently next time, how would that make an impact? And suddenly you do it, keep it in the positive all the way through and hoping that they come up with the answers, but you can add in the developmental areas as well. We, we need to confront it. The first thing we're going to do is actually challenge that behavior and, and, and talk to them about it. And, you know, even when I just said the word challenge there, I sort of cringed a little bit because we some people challenge in inappropriate ways. Um, you've got to remember we're all adults at work and we're not children. We're not teachers. We don't get told off. We need to go and have a conversation with people at work and just sit down and say, you know, I've noticed that you, you're drinking a lot of these energy drinks. Um, and this is what I this is what I observe. How does it come across for you? And have an adult conversation with somebody. It's one of the most powerful ways to create change in people is raise people's awareness, have those conversations. And just as, as we move on to the next slide, there's one that I know um, many small businesses outside out in the industry with are, are largely made up of family members and the the management discussions are really hard when you're when you're all in it together and, and that stepping out can be seen as sort of a luxury for the bigger companies, can't it? How would you recommend those smaller firms look at management and separation, Matt? Oh, um, it, it, it's, it's part of the job and it's, uh, it's what I've got to do at work. And we know that when I come to work, I put my uniform on for work and that's what I do. When I take my uniform off at the end of the day, we're back to family again. Um, and you've got to have those boundaries in place um you know I, i've certainly worked with some people that i was i was best friends with um yet at work we had stuff to do and we would disagree we would argue um and we had the agreement at the end of the day um when we went home that was that um and we were still friends you've both got to go into that though in the agreement that that's how we're going to operate and disagree, uh, di uh, divide the parts up this is work this is home Behaviors for work are here. This is what we're going to discuss in the home life, and it's and it's different, um, and it's tough. It's you know because there is a great there'll, there'll always be a grey area. There'll always be grey topics. Um, when is it the right time to bring these up? But you've got to try and be really um, strict with the way you behave around that. It's, it's a tough space to work in. Okay, so we've done lots of of ideas on how to motivate motivate people, but what actually is motivation, Matt? Um, what is motivation? Well, it's been aware of the, what we just talked about, this purpose master autonomy. Um, previously, or what we currently do, is we have something called extrinsic motivation. It's one of the most common ways you'll see how we motivate people. Um, if you do this, I'll do that for you. If you do really well at work, you get a promotion. If you do really well at work, I'll give you a pay rise. If you don't do well at work, you're going to get the sack. There's all these external motivators to drive our performance. They're not working anymore. They're just not working. We need to go to this internal motivation. We need people to start the enjoyment, have purpose, growth in the business, growth in themselves, curiosity, understand passion. If we get that in the workplace, this intrinsic motivation, we know productivity and performance goes through the roof. We are seeing a massive decrease in motivation in the workplace through extrinsic motivation. It, however, it's one of the most common ways to motivate people that we've learned over the last 20 to 30 years. However, it's almost like we need a reboot. You know, this is uh, 2.0, the extrinsic. We now need to go to 2.1 and go to the intrinsic motivation. We're, we, and we are seeing this change. Some of the big industries out there, Apple, Google, they're all going to this purpose master autonomy model. And we're moving into that. So over the next sort of five to 10 years, I think we'll be understanding that a lot more. And there'll be motivation around that, knowing that pay isn't necessarily uh, the biggest motivator in the workplace. It's important but it's not the biggest motivator. And I think that comes back to your earlier comment, doesn't it, about these softer skills gonna to have to be the skills that we take forward 
for the future to really make the most of that concept? Yeah, I, I think coaching, you know, coaching started out in the sports environment. Sports teams were doing extremely well with great coaches or great managers, whichever way you want to look at it, They're, you know, coach or manager. Um, and businesses starts going, well, let's have a bit of that. And it's taking its time to come into business. Businesses, you know, we now have external business coaches. We have executive coaches. They charge extortionate amount of money in places. Um, but there's some fantastic results from coaching. I think creating a coaching culture within a business where we look at a new way of operating on intrinsic motivation aligned with coaching, I think that's where you're going to see some of the biggest growth in performances in businesses by adopting the new model of motivation in the workspace. Yeah, and we've got um, we've got a comment saying um, a little bit going back to that management and, and splitting it out um, with the with your workload. Um, agree with what you're saying, but in the dairy industry, we're quite unique. Um, most of us have to lead from the front in a hands-on way. Now, mm. I think the answer to that, Matt, would be more about it's not about having two different roles, is it? It's about having time to do each role when you're in that kind of circumstance. <laughs> time to do different roles. Um, there, there is no, you know. There is no one way to do something and that, you know, otherwise we'd have the one rule, but there's thousands of different models. Um, and I, I've been chatting to our, to our team at G's to say, you know, which, what, what leadership model do you want to do? Because a lot of businesses adopt a leadership model. And I've been having some thoughts around, is that right for us? Not the sense that is that model correct, but actually, um, Authentic leadership is what I believe is, is the, the way forward. Um, and it almost links back to the dairy industry. To be an authentic leader, maybe in your dairy industry, you need to do it this way. Great, well, what way is that? What is the best way that you do it well? So for me, learning about all these different motivation models, leadership models, management models, learn them all and then go, which ones sit naturally with me? So I'm not trying to be something I'm not trying to be to do but which ones actually sit with me really well and that i can apply easily and then look at that and, go, and learn more about it because that's the type of leader you are how can i really develop that and become brilliant at that style of leadership or that style of management because that's my natural style that, and that's authentic leadership authentic management and different industries will require different set of skills and you'll have all, you'll be working in that and probably doing it naturally anyway so if it's working for you keep doing it Keep doing it and make sure it's working for you and your staff. If it's not working for your staff, then we need to start looking what else can we start bringing into that? How can we adapt? How can we flex? How can we change? We certainly know that the, the leader or the manager with the greatest behavioural flexibility will get the best results with people. We have to be consistent, but we have to be flexible in the way we speak to people, we engage with people and we motivate people in the workplace. So what about looking in the mirror, Matt? If, we, if we're trying to motivate other people, why is it so important we understand ourselves first? Yeah, so any time we go on a journey and we look at leadership, management, motivation, we have to understand self. It always starts with self. We need to know more about what works, what doesn't work for us. Um, and the more we can understand that, then we start getting choices talking about other people. So the, the leadership model that's uh, one of the easiest ones to sort of look at is self others context um, so we look at self then we learn about others then we apply that into the context of the workplace um, once you've raised your awareness around yourself you can then start it gives you options or you can ask questions and then you can create options around that um, now I, I put a, a colored triangle up there I could have put up probably a dozen different uh, tools on there um, to do self-awareness with. I, I like this one. This one's called Strength Deployment Inventory, and it's based around your values and what you do well in given situations, etc. You can have Myers Briggs type indicator, Belvin team roles, insights. There's lots of different ones out there, and for me, all of them are brilliant. I've got no issues with any of them. I like them all because they're a key to a conversation. They're helping me raise my awareness. Now, some people go, oh, "If I do this, I'm going to be put into a box." Well, not really. It's just saying that's my preference. I can do all of it, but I prefer to be in this space here. So some people then go, well, I'm not going to be too honest on it. Well, then you're not going to get the benefit back from doing the tools. I love doing these tools because I can sit there. I'll be 
brutally honest with it and then read through it and go, oh, is that a trend in my life? Is that what I'm working there? And um, is that what I'm doing? So raising my awareness around my behaviours is really key to know how I can then engage with other people and start watching those for other people. If we look at the tool that's on the screen, uh, I'll briefly, see, you know, because it's now, I'll quickly talk to you about it. Um, this is the first company that used colours into psychometrics. Um, and they've been going quite a long time. It's from a, a doctor called Dr. Elias Porter. Uh, and he came up with these three key areas. Um, the red people, so when you do the questionnaire and you come out red, it's all about performance, task focused. Um, you then you've got the green area, which is all about process, detail, structure. And then you've got the blue area, which is about people, nurturing and developing people. Um, and then it's got the blend. So you've got the red, blue blend in the middle, you've got the red, green, and you've got the blue, green. And then you've got the hub in the middle. It's like the um, X in the middle. Uh, that's called the hub, the, the flexible motivation in the middle. Um, and a lot of people, I'll ask them a question. I'll say, which place on there makes the best leader? Who makes the best leader? And, it, and people will go, they'll either say their own colour, whichever one they've come out in because they want it to be their own colour, or they might go the reds, and then we go, really? Or greens, or hubs, and it goes all over the place. Actually, the, anybody can make the best leader. It's having the awareness of what strengths you bring to a situation and how you can get the best out of other people. Um, and then you can also build your team around it. So if I was looking at a team dynamics around the triangle here, for instance, if I had no reds in my team and I only had blues and greens in my team, the behaviours I'd be seeing would be everybody's happy because we've got the blues keeping everybody working, checking out there. We know exactly what we're going to be doing because the greens are there, um, making sure we've got the detail and the facts right. And we've got the blues making sure we're happy. We know what we're doing. We're happy. We know what we're doing. We're happy. We know what we're doing. But we've got nobody driving it, pushing the task forward. So we need some reds in the team to drive that task forwards. If, for instance, we had no greens in the team, what would be going on? We'd be doing loads of stuff and we'd all be just getting on with it, with the blues, making sure everyone's just getting on with it, reds driving it, but we're probably making quite a lot of mistakes and learning from mistakes till we actually get it right. So we'll probably get it wrong quite a few times before we get it right. We've got no blues in the team. You get some conflicts, quite severe conflicts. You get the reds that just want to drive on and just get the task done, and you get the greens that just want to think about it and go, hang hey, on, let me just think about it. And uh, and and the reds are like, no, let me go. And the greens are like, oh, slow down, let me think. I want to just get the facts right, and that causes a lot of conflicts. So you need the blues to come in and start building that together. Um, certainly, when I was uh, in a previous job, I did a lot of mountaineering. And uh, I used to take loads of people up into the mountains uh, and I was a bit of a quite a strong red. So I'd literally be driving up there, I'd get into the car park and I'd be right, come on, get out of the truck, let's go, top of the mountain. And I'd be charging off because I was a red. My task was get to the top of the hill, sweet stand. I'd get halfway up there and I'd be looking back and the other reds are saying, yes, come on. And they'd be with me like that. I could hear the blues saying, Come on, let's keep Matt happy and just get up to the top of the mountain with Matt. Come on, everybody, let's go. And I'd be like, yes, come on, charging up to the top of the hill. I look back and there's still some people in that flipping car park, which really started to bug me. So I charged back down the hill and being a red, I was a little bit loud as well. Come on, Matt. And the greens were going, Matt. I'm like, what? Matt, 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 I've been trying to tell you. So what? Matt, you're going over the wrong mountain. We should be going that way. Oh, right, everybody, down we come, off we go. Now, I find that quite funny because that's actually happened to me probably more than once, being a strong red. Um, the greens, though, wouldn't want to be doing the ones at the front driving it. They've led it or helped me in my team task by being there. So as a red, I need to be aware that greens need me to be a little bit quiet and ask them for support. Blues need to be aware. So we all need to be aware of what our strengths are, but how we need to work with other people. So raising our awareness with whatever tool you want to use, it's great. But raise your awareness around your behaviours. Understand what motivates you. Understand your preference. Understand what drives you. Because with that, you can choose to keep it the same, or you can choose to start changing it and ask questions and start creating a development plan for yourself. But it starts the conversation. These are all keys to having a fantastic conversation. And do you think it's right that you ever try and stray away from your natural 
focus? I mean, there's obviously development areas. Or do you think you should try and hide one area or dull it down a bit, or is that going to lead to problems no, in the future? No, I think you should be trying every single area. So within this tool specifically, they they, they coach you and they say you need to have A, B, C. So it's called assess, borrow, and communicate. So when I've got my team and I know where my team are, if I'm a red and I've got a green in my team, I need to assess that and go, oh, there's my green. I then need to borrow green behaviors and, and the way they operate and communicate to them as a green. So I need to really practice that because that's quite hard for me, you know, but I need to be good at it because I've got to have flexibility to move around that triangle, move around all my behaviors, we mentioned earlier on the manager or the leader with the greatest behavioral flexibility gets the best results from people. It's tiring, it's hard work, motivating, engaging, communicating, but that's where we get the best results with people. And is it a case of once you're red, you're always a red map? Um, so difficult to say because uh, it, within this context of strength deployment entry, this is based around your values. Now your values are created at a very young age between the age of zero and seven, and your values are like an anchor on the floor of the seabed. They're solid, they're heavy, and they hardly ever move. Those values may move if you have a significant life event, near death experience or something like that, but they'll only ever move a little bit. They'll have a bit of a lump to one way or the other way. These are your preferences. This is what drives you. Now attach to that anchor at the bottom, is a buoy on the surface of the water. That buoy, depending on what's going on outside with the wind, the rain and the weather, could be swaying all over the place. You move from blue to red to green. But when it all settles down, that buoy will settle directly over the anchor. And that's just its preferred place. We like to spend time in our preferred place, but we need the flexibility and be able to move around our behaviours and around the triangle to make sure we can get the best out of other people. That's brilliant. And it, it's hard to, we've got one more slide looking at ego states. And I think this is, you, you've touched on this sort of concept already, Matt, but do you want to explain it in a bit more detail? Yeah, uh, so this is um, a course I did quite a few years ago called Transactional Analysis. Um, it's, you know, you can do a two day course, a week's course in it, whatever. This is probably my two minute version of uh, Transactional Analysis. These are ego states. Um, and Ego is one of the biggest things that gets in the way of motivating other people, engaging with other people, communicating with other people, is our own egos. Um, and we've got to be aware of it. We need to raise our awareness. Um, we talk about uh, the good old days before COVID, um, where I'd be away teaching, training, working away for days or weeks on end. I come back and I come into the house. There's my two boys. I dive on the sofa with them. I'm the superhero dad. Four minutes, well, I'm fighting, I'm having a right laugh, and I'm proper in the child ego state. The wife's been home, had a tough few days with the boys, and she walks in and she goes, I want to speak to you in the kitchen now. Right. So I'm in the child ego state. My wife would be in the controlling parent state. What reaction do you think I'm going to give to my wife? Woohoo! Not interesting because I'm in the child ego state and I'm having a whirl of a time. Not going to get the response from me whatsoever. What is that to my wife? Fires her off even more in a different direction into the controlling parent state. Communication, not going to work. Now, who wanted to have that conversation? So the individual that wanted that conversation needs to move down to the level of conversation. Or the, or the ego state of the, the person. So in this situation, my wife and needs to drop down into the child ego state to get my attention. So she had to jump on the sofa. How was everything, Matt? What's going on? Any chance we can have a quick chat in the kitchen? Oh yeah, certainly. Boom. And then she suddenly bounces me back up into the adult state. And then we have that conversation, adult to adult. At work, there'll be triggers that go on. You will see a behavior, you'll hear something said that triggers you to go into the controlling parent state. And then you start talking down to other people, either down to people in the adult or down to people in the child. Communication, engagement, motivation will not work. If you need to have a conversation with them, you've got to let that ego go a little bit and mirror them on their level and then move them either up or move them down into the adult state by the way you talk to somebody. And that's so powerful. You know, understand what are your triggers? 
What triggers you to go into one of those states? What triggers you to be in the child ego state? What triggers you to go into the controlling parent state? How are those communications working out for you when you're in those states? Probably not good if you need to have an adult conversation, but that's where the great stuff happens is when we can talk to each other adult to adult. Thanks for that. I think that was one of the one of the present when you gave the presentation that really hit home to everybody because we can all appreciate those different states that we end up in. Um, but I think key to say is is, is that identifying what, what the triggers are, isn't it? So bringing it to an end now, we're, we're we're nearly an hour in now, Matt. Thank you very much. Is there any more questions from the from the people listening? Feel free to tap away. We've got five minutes. Um, to ask Matt a few more questions, but while we're waiting for those to come in, um, the video that Matt mentioned earlier on in the presentation is, um, you can see the link there, and that's the image you get when you put that link in, so you know you've got the right video. Um, we will share that link on the recording, so there'll be an email that comes out to you in the next couple of days with a link to the recording of this, and it'll also have the link here. So do you want to explain the video a little bit more, Matt? Uh, yeah, the videos of uh, Dan Pink uh, explaining, you don't actually see Dan Pink, you see an artist drawing away in the background, it's really engaging, it's quite a unique video, but he talks around the studies and the, and, and the effects of motivation on the workplace, intrinsic, extrinsic motivation through purpose, mastery, autonomy. Uh, you might hear a few of the words that I've explained today that I've probably stolen from him over the years, I've been talking about it for quite a long time now, um, but it's one of the most powerful videos that I came across in my journey of learning and development. Um, and I'll be using a lot of businesses to really good effect on how we uh, change our operating model on working with people. So really recommend it. He's got some great books. The book called Drive that you can buy as well is, is a really good book and it goes into a lot more detail around motivation in the workplace. That's brilliant. And I think when we were talking about this with the group, there's quite a few podcasts out there as well, isn't there? If people don't want to get into a full book, just want to, to listen to a few top tips. Yeah, podcasts. And there's a lot of free resources out there. You know, the, the video is free on, on YouTube and uh, and some podcasts will be out there on motivation. There's, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of good stuff uh, talking about the why. You know, we always start with the why. The why is the purpose. Why do we do something? Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name off the top of my head, but there's some really good um, uh, podcast videos uh, around motivation and, and why, because it always starts with the why. Why do we do it? Why do we get up? Why do we come to work? Okay, so the, the questions are flowing in now. I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but um, got a, a 20 year old girl that comes in um, to work, sometimes comes in grumpy when she's good she's fantastic but when she's grumpy really hard work how do you deal with somebody that could be one way one day and one way the next so I, personally i'd be praising the positive behavior and and highlighting the positive behavior saying oh, i really enjoy your behavior today or when they're in that positive state and then i'd be ignoring obviously i don't know the context i don't know how extreme these contexts are but i would be i wouldn't be feeding the negative behavior so i'd always feed the positive behavior that we want in the workspace and i wouldn't be talking about the negative behavior i wouldn't even be recognizing that behavior i'd just be carrying on as normal in the workplace so they know that they're going to get rewarded for the positive but not get rewarded for the negative and we've we've got two two come in here at very similar um timings and very similar topics what do you do with the the rotten apple in the lot? What what about that mood hoover that just brings the rest of the team down? How do you really do you look at getting rid of them? Do you have to manage them? What, what would be your best suggestion? I would look at myself first, and that's my honest answer. I would say, what is it that I'm not doing to connect with this individual? Um, because there could well be something that we're not doing. We probably not. You know, I go back to my days at school and. You know, I, I really struggled at school. I failed all my GCSEs. I was a nightmare student at school. Um, and I, I was chatting to my mum about it uh, not that long ago. And um, she was a teacher, not at the school, but she was a, she was a school teacher. And she said to me, it, it's, it wasn't to do with you. They, could, they couldn't teach you. They didn't have the skill set to unlock the way you like to learn. And that really resonated with me. And I see that in in teams in the workplace that we sometimes get rid of people or move people on because we can't understand them we can't unlock them we haven't been able to motivate them and that's sometimes sometimes down to our skill set 
of leaders of management skill set and we haven't found the right skill set we haven't learned the right way to unlock with those, these people so i always check myself first if i've done everything in the possible that i can do to work with that then it could well be that we've just got to start working with the individual um and do it going down the performance management way that's that is an option um or it's one-to-one -one coaching with the individual you know there, there is you know people talk about business coaching that's very much transactional business coaching but there's also emotional behavioral coaching around changing people's behaviors so there's lots of different skill sets out there now that you can work with to help people change and we, we've had a couple of people come in with the recommendation for and i might not pronounce the name right simon sinek Simon um, Sinek. About start with why. yeah start with why yeah and so if anybody's looking at how they can improve their own skill set then there's some TED talks and, and podcasts out there by Simon that would, would help you as well so just before we sign off um have you got any lasting sort of tips you want to leave with the group Matt um be the groover create the change that we want to see in other people and that would be the main thing for me create the change we want to see in others fantastic so thank you very much um, for everyone listening tonight and all those fantastic questions that we've had. If you do think of anything afterwards, feel free to get in touch with us um, afterwards. So you'll, you'll get an email with all the details and it'll have my contact details on there as well. Um, but most of all, thank you to Matt for being an absolute groover all the way through this and keeping up the momentum and, and motivating us for on a, on a Monday evening as, as the rain sets in. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in a, another webinar.